All right, shall we get started? Good morning. All right, so um, I'm Carlos from Nordic, and I'll be presenting today about uh, how we at Nordic develop and maintain a Zephyr-based microcontroller SDK. I'll start by talking a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a former demo scene coder. I don't know, you know if you're familiar with that, but you can go it later. I don't really have time to go into the, the details, but it's, it's quite a fun uh, amateur scene for, for programming. Uh, I'm an embedded engineer now uh, with a background in Bluetooth. I started in Bluetooth uh, back in 2000, I believe, so a long time ago. I've been employed by Nordic since 2010, so uh, uh, celebrating my 13th uh, anniversary this year. Uh, I'm based in Barcelona. I like cycling a lot uh, in the hills. Um, I also co-authored a book about Bluetooth Low Energy back when I was working in the soft device. The soft device was, uh, or is, uh, Nordic's uh, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy stack. And um, I was part of that team, and I designed the API. I also co-authored this, this book um, about Bluetooth. I was the main person in the, uh, in the beginning to, to drive the push to adopt Zephyr at Nordic. So I'm the one to blame. Uh, if you're a customer who's not happy, some, some are not, some are. So there's a little bit of everything. Of everything. And uh, right now, I had uh, a team called Vestavind, which means West Wind. Zephyr is a Western wind, as you probably know, uh, in Norwegian. And uh, it's a team I'll be talking a little bit about uh, later. So let's talk a little bit about Nordic. Um, Nordic is a fabless semiconductor company, so like many others, we make uh, chips. Uh, we are specialists in low-power wireless, so uh, we, don't, we don't typically, well, we don't do at all generalist uh, MCUs, uh, generic you know, MCUs like other companies do. We, all of our MCUs have some sort of wireless connectivity built into them. We are a market leader, especially in short range, so Bluetooth Low Energy in particular, but also Thread and uh, other technologies we'll be talking about. And then we are uh, also introduced some years ago uh, LTEM and narrowband IoT, so beyond a short range, also a longer range. And now we're expanding into the Wi-Fi uh, market. Recently we presented or we introduced our first uh, Wi-Fi chips uh, into the market. Um, we have offices a little bit all over the world. We've been growing a lot um, since I joined, so the company has been doing well and, uh, and, and growing. But the company is actually pretty old. It started in 1983, doing custom ASIC designs at the time. Um, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary uh, this year, so we have some uh, really nice celebrations lined up, uh, particularly for employees. <laughs> uh, we're 1,300 right now and, and growing, so of which 76% is R&D, so it's a very technology-oriented company. And you know, sort of uh, um, uh, financial type information, uh, not very familiar with that, but uh, there you go. So our chips, I want to talk about our chips because really the purpose of all the work I do at Nordic and me and my team and many other teams is to support these chips because we sell chips, the, the software is free, right? So when our customers buy uh, our products, they're buying our chips and the software is just there to convince them to buy it and to be, to, to be able then to develop their software that runs on the, on the chips. So we have um, uh, chips for short range. You can see here the 52, 53, and the upcoming 54 series. They support Bluetooth, Thread, and Matter. These three logos there, the uh, three tiny logos. Uh, we, like this year, we introduced the NRF70 uh, series, uh, which is Wi-Fi. Right now, it's, uh, we only have a, a companion chip, so to speak, but uh, uh, which you know, a company is, which, which sits side by side by, uh, by, uh, with another MCU. Then the, there's the NRF91 series, which, we, which I, was, I talked about a, a minute ago. They, they support uh, LTEM, narrowband IoT, and in the future, there's this new standard called DEC10R that we are working towards uh, supporting. And we're actually part of the specification um, uh, working groups, just like we are with Bluetooth. We're big contributors to the Bluetooth spec, by the way. And then also, relatively recently, we've introduced uh, other product ranges, uh, PIMIX and range extenders. And of all these um, products, almost all of them, of the, these chips, are supported in upstream Zephyr um, today. Not all of them, but almost. And if they're not, we'll probably work towards getting them in. Where do Nordic uh, ICs live in actual products? Um, our, typically, our bread and butter, when we started selling chips, uh, not custom chips, but rather generic chips, wireless chips, they, we started with the HID market, so mice, keyboards, 
uh, and so on, but there's been uh, a bit of everything, medical, uh, gaming, uh, tax, so smart tax, uh, lighting. Uh, for Bluetooth Mesh, for example, was a big boost for the lighting systems. So uh, being able to connect uh, multiple light bulbs in Mesh uh, and being able to turn them on by just connecting to one of them and then relaying that information uh, and all sorts. Uh, and with LTEM and Narrowband IoT, we're getting into the asset tracking business uh, and uh, uh, this type of um, uh, uh, different applications that we couldn't reach with Bluetooth. So, so we're now, you know, uh, a company that's present in multiple segments. So I want to talk a little bit about how our SOCs have evolved over time, because that's one of the major motivations that drove us to actually uh, adopt Zephyr. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually had to look this up, because although I've been at, at, at Nordic now for a long time, I didn't remember the numbers, and it's quite astounding, actually, when I did my research. So in 2004, I wasn't there. We introduced a, a chip called the 24LE1. It's, uh, you know, it's been enormously successful uh, as a wireless, non-Bluetooth, proprietary wireless um, connectivity solution. And it had 16K of flash and 1K of RAM uh, on an 8051 uh, running at 16 megahertz. In 2012, some years later, we introduced the, our first sort of modern Cortex-M-based um, series, the uh, NRF51. Cortex M0, not M0+, plus, uh, M0 at 16 megahertz, 256 up to. Uh, all of the numbers here are up to, so the series, there will be different variants, but these are the highest numbers so of, of each series. 256K of flash, 32K of RAM, uh, so that's the, ch the chip that introduced the soft device architecture. And then there was the NRF52, uh, 2015, and now we, we stepped up from an M0 to an M4, uh, 64 megahertz, one megabyte of flash this time, and 256K of RAM. So, uh, you know, scaling up. In terms of supported technologies, all of those support our proprietary technologies, the one that used to be uh, popular with mice and keyboard with a little dongle that you connect to the PC, but also then Bluetooth Low Energy started with the NRF51, and then Threat uh, starting with the NRF52. Uh, then the NRF53, 2020, we're already dual core now uh, at 128 megahertz, so no longer single core, that complicates things. Uh, starts getting, we start getting into the IPC uh, primitives, we start uh, needing to build to images uh, and so on and so on, so complexity uh, raises. We're at uh, one megabyte plus 256 uh, flash, uh, that's per core, and 512 plus 64, and now we support matter on top of the technologies we already supported. And finally, the upcoming family that's not, uh, it's been pre-announced, but uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't have a release date yet. It has, I, I cannot <laughs> unveil more than what has been already uh, said in the press releases, but basically multiple ARM uh, Cortex-M33 cores at 320 uh, megahertz, uh, multiple RISC-5 coprocessors, two megabytes of flash, one megabyte of RAM. So as you can see, and I have a, a little diagram here to show this, um, the, the amount of flash, RAM, and the clock speed, and you know, don't pay attention to the y-axis, this is just for reference, but uh, the point is that the complexity in the chips has been, raised, has been rising nonstop since we introduced our first commercially available off-the-shelf uh, chip until now where we're developing the NRF54 that will come out uh, uh, at some point in the near future. We just have more flash, more RAM and uh, more megahertz, and it's not just that the uh, that that the uh, um, uh, that we introduce variants with more flash and, and RAM. It's that the even the basic the, the most basic chips in each new family have more flash and RAM. So it's a, it's a, everything is pushing forwards and up. So there's no um, there's no stopping this. So that's a fact, and uh, you know in Nordic we realize that. And so let's talk about the software that goes with, uh, with these chips. So, like I said, we offer a software development kit. We offer software, and that's free of charge. It's almost like every other silicon vendor. You download the SDK, uh, you start developing your application, and the SDK gives you everything you need to write an application. Drivers, uh, storage, uh, uh, kernel if necessary, uh, everything you, that's required in order to develop uh, an IoT slash uh, embedded application. So, um, uh, and then the thing is, the architecture itself 
uh, of the SDK had not evolved as quickly. And this, this, this happens often because the, the, the hardware uh, kind of, it, it tends upwards with the market as well. So there's new nodes, new, new process nodes, there's new ways, uh, new, new non-volatile uh, storage technologies, um, uh, new libraries from the foundries, et cetera, et cetera. And that naturally pushes the chips uh, uh, forward, but that doesn't, for, doesn't necessarily happen with the software. The software, uh, sometimes it can get stuck in the past, uh, and that's what happened to us. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and we, we, realized that, we realized that, and I will go over that, uh, because it's not just that the software had to evolve and had to improve, it's that the amount of software that we had to write for uh, an MCU SDK basically skyrocketed. The complexity skyrocketed. We just, you know, it, it just went so fast. So at some point in 2016, we realized that the SDK offering that we had was really not ready for the future. It was not scalable. Uh, you know, we knew we wanted, we were about to introduce uh, uh, our first long range wireless chip and the software wasn't there. So what were the problems with this software? Well, first, it wasn't scalable. We had an SDK per technology. So if you wanted to do Bluetooth, you would download a zip file. If you wanted to do mesh, another one, and it was really difficult to combine them. On top of that, not all our chips were supported by all SDKs because of internal reasons, the development. So that, that was, again, for the customer, for the user, that was a nightmare. Um, we also had a very inefficient development model at the time. So there was no common code base. We had everybody lived, so every team developing every SDK was living in their own silo, and there was some cooperation, but it was ad hoc at best, and it wasn't really uh, made for the future. You, that, that we knew that that would not scale. So on top of that, we didn't have enough software engineers to work on all the software that we realized we had to develop. This came, became very obvious when we started with uh, needing a TCP IP stack for narrowband IoT and, and LTEM and LWM to M. And, you know, it, it became obvious that it was too much software for a company that didn't have enough engineers to, to write it. Uh, then there was the problem of updates. Up, you're, you're a customer, you start developing your application, uh, and you know, some months, years after, uh, you want to update to a more recent version of the SDK, and updating was really complicated. And this was in part uh, due to the fact that the, 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 there were multiple SDKs, that the, the architecture of the, of the SDK was not really designed for that. Uh, another problem was that we were kind of stuck in the past. You know, we, we were now at, uh, at the Cortex M33 level because we were uh, with the NF91 that had a, an M33, it had a powerful micro, uh, mi uh, microcontroller core, had lots of RAM, lots of flash, but we, only, we could only offer bare metal to our customers. And Arthos, you know, like it, it, in the last few years, you probably know that already, it's been slowly but surely pushing uh, or, or becoming the standard, using more and more uh, Arthos. So the, the world of embedded software is ten, trending towards that, but we weren't there. We were, we were absolutely isolated from that, and we, we only had uh, a bare metal SDK. On top of that, we could not offer uh, advanced scalability systems like configuration and, and, uh, and hardware description, and we were relying on the different IDE uh, mechanisms that were you know, ad hoc <laughs> and, 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 and barely uh, uh, holding together at best. It was just not, uh, not a good system. On top of that, the distribution model. So I think that's still the case in some, for, for, for some vendors, but uh, our SDK was offered as a zip file. You just click download, and that was a zip file. You take that zip file, you'll unzip it, and then you, as a customer, uh, you, then you had to either create a Git repo with it or a subversion a repo, put it on the version control. So there was no version control by default. Uh, that has several downsides, but for me, the biggest downside is that for the user, they had no idea between one version and another why we had made those changes. There was no description, there was no, you just got, got a, a huge dump of files, and that's it, and no idea why we got from one uh, to the other. You could make a diff, for sure, uh, but there was no justification, no explanation as to why things had been. For example, I remember, I remember back then we rewrote a couple of systems, one of them was the bond manager, I think it was, and we had, you know, very good internal documentation about why the shortcomings and so on, but that re never reached our customers. They never knew why we did that. So uh, that was a shame. So we started looking around, shopping around, and thinking about what we could do to make the situation better. Uh, the thing is, coincidentally, or maybe not, maybe it was the, the whole world was tending towards that, uh, uh, short before, I think, uh, I think Zephyr was 
introduced uh, in 2016, early in 2016. So we started looking around mid-2016, just, just after Zephyr had been released to the world. Obviously, this was Zephyr, very early Zephyr, right? The very beginnings of, of Zephyr. So uh, a small group of people, me, um, uh, initially, but then I got help from uh, other contributors and other Nordic employees. Uh, we started a small pre-study to evaluate the, fe the feasibility of actually using it, taking Zephyr and using it as a framework for our future SDKs. And um, not all, sorry, not only Zephyr, but other artists. So we, we started, I remember, I remember vividly, we started by looking at everything that was there, like uh, pr uh, proprietary artists, like you know, commercial for, uh, that, that you had to pay for, then open source ones. But the thing is, very quickly, a few of us decided, sort of arbitrarily uh, decided, based on what we were seeing, that open source was the future of, uh, uh, of uh, embedded software development, just like it had been, or it was already the present of mobile phone Cortex-A software for Android and, and so on, but also server software. So we thought that that open source revolution was going to happen in the embedded world, just like it had before in the other uh, segments. So we went out and studied in depth the open source artists because we were now focusing on open source artists. So we studied all of them. Riot, Contiki, uh, Minute, Embed, NotX, FreeRTOS, and Zephyr, of course. Of course, not all of them are comparable, uh, but we still went through them all. We tested them out, built some apps, and you know, in the end, we settled for Zephyr for many reasons, and I've, you know, I've talked about this many times with some people too. Back then to justify now that Zephyr is a bit bigger and kind of settled as a, as, a, you know, as, a, as a very important project in the industry, uh, they asked me this a little bit less, but back then is why did you choose Zephyr? Well, for starters, it was open governance. That was not the case with all the other artists. This means that not, not, no single company could impose their view. It was a vote, it was, uh, you know, it was a, essentially a cooperative uh, 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 a cooperative decision-making process. Cross-architecture, again, not all of the artists in my list before were cross-architecture, and we knew sooner or later we would need to uh, go beyond ARM, and that's a fact with our la latest offering, right, it's, uh, which has RISC five cores. Uh, focused on small footprint, problem with some of them is they were, small footprint was th uh, theoretically supported, but it wasn't their main focus, so you tried to build for a small MCU and things would blow up. Very good code quality, uh, strict code reviews, clean commit history, that actually is you know, surprisingly important. Uh, and also it was battery inclu batteries included, not only a kernel, more than a kernel, and we wanted that. We wanted it specifically something that, was be that went beyond the kernel. So we assessed the risks, uh, and you know, it wasn't easy, to, to, to push this through internally. Uh, you know, uh, this was a very disruptive uh, break. There was a lot of uncertainty in 2016 of where Zephyr would be in five years. Um, there were also concerns with software IP inside Nordic, like what happens to our IP if we start contributing to open source. But we ended up moving forward with it. There was a, a, a sentence that someone said, um, I, I, I think it was me, but I don't even remember. So if someone said, instead of waiting to see if Zephyr and open source end up happening, we can actually make them happen. So what we decided to do is, let's go all in, let's uh, buy into Zephyr, base our SDKs on Zephyr, and contribute to Zephyr. So we decided to create the NRF Connect SDK also known uh, as NCS. So we went from bare metal to Artos, Zephyr. We went from zip files to, uh, sorry, we went from multiple SDKs to a single one, a single unified code base. Uh, we went from a zip file to GitHub for distribution. And finally, we went from a development model where each project would push directly, uh, sometimes without even code review, to a system based on pull requests where everybody has their code review before it goes into the, the main branch. So that was the, 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 the whole setup, the whole idea. And, you know, be, behind that, there was a develop, an internal development model, lots of hours, uh, convincing people, and, you know, uh, and setting up everything we needed to make this happen. So let's start uh, uh, with the first point, bare metal to Artos. So Zephyr, obviously, is the, the core of NRF Connect SDK. In fact, all of our samples and applications are Zephyr applications. We don't, we don't have a, a special build system layer. They are uh, Zephyr applications. All of, or almost all of our SOCs and boards are upstream uh, to simplify our lives, mostly, but also our customers. And then, you know, NCS as, a, as, a, as, a, as an SDK makes super heavy use of everything in, the, in, in Zephyr. So the kernel, the device and driver model, uh, the OS services, the connectivity. So it's not, we didn't pick Zephyr for the kernel. We actually use everything, in, or not everything, but many of the components uh, present in Zephyr. 
Single code base, that's one, uh, other, other of the, uh, another of the four tenets that we adopted that uh, had to make it happen. So uh, I just spoke like we, uh, uh, a few minutes ago the, about using the proprietary IDEs, back then Kyle and, and IAR mostly, which would then provide the build and configuration system. So the, the, the actual build system, the, the, the make file, so to speak, was actually the IDE and also the configuration. We used some Kyle uh, system that they had, but it was really difficult to maintain because obviously, first of all, we had to support multiple. They were not really uh, consistent. Uh, and you know, the, the whole thing was not uh, unified, that was our problem. From there, we went to industry what we call industry standard tooling. I mean, CMake is a pretty much a standard today, uh, so we use CMake for building. Uh, in, fact, in fact, the transition from Make to CMake in Zephyr was uh, contributed by us. Uh, we also uh, now use kconfig, just like Zephyr, to configure, and we have one way of configuring the code, and only one, and you don't need an ID for it, you can do it from the command line, and also device tree for describing the hardware itself. Then, uh, there was the, um, the distribution model. So, the, uh, so like I said uh, before, I mentioned this before, the, the distributing uh, the, the SDK with zip files, no version control, no visibility onto, as to why changes had happened, no intermediate fix, fixes as well. That's very important because between two releases, let's say between one and, and, and a release and another three months elapse, you're basically completely clueless of what's happening. If there's a fix that, ha that has happened in the tree, you as a customer, as a user, have no way of finding out uh, unless you have a support engineer sending it to you. Uh, with GitHub, it's obviously it's much more convenient. So first of all, you're using uh, version control already. GitHub is a standard. Git is a standard. It's easier to update using Git and West. We'll talk about the West in a minute. Uh, the Git history is all there uh, for all to see in plain sight. So why? Uh, change was made is visible. All the fixes and improvements that we, Nordic developers, push are immediately available to, to everyone. So uh, a lot of advantages in, in this model. And the development model when it comes to contributions, again, that was completely reworked from scratch. So instead of having these silos, these uh, teams with their own project leads that would then push or accept the push, or we, we then said, okay, we, we will inspire ourselves uh, on the, the open source development model that we have upstream. By the time, we were pretty familiar with it because we were already maintainers, some of us. Uh, so we said, okay, anyone can contribute, uh, inside or outside Nordic. So not only, what, this actually brought some real tangible benefits in me almost immediately, is that uh, um, Nordic employees like FAEs, no, uh, field applications and engineers, support engineers, now could contribute to the code base. Before they had to open a ticket and w hope for the best. Now they could actually send the patch, and they do. So, and that's very, very useful and, and practical and optimized. And of course, users and customers as well. So obviously this required a lot of adjustments, internal adjustments. Uh, we had to transition from internal Git servers to GitHub, uh, a hierarchy of maintainers. Just basically the open source, mapping the open source model to an internal development model took some time, but we did manage to get there, and now we're, you know, we have a model that we're satisfied with. So just very briefly, so what is NCS? We take from Zephyr, we take a, a subset of Zephyr, but that's a, a very substantial subset, kernel libraries, build system, device and config, Zephyr modules and West, I'll talk about those in a minute, and then Twister, which is the test tool, we also use that. And then on top of that, we add proprietary features and technology, applications and reference designs, testing and qualification, technical support, and uh, VS Code integration. So basically what this means is Nordic engineers are free to work uh, on things that add value, add actual value. So does a kernel add value? Not really. There's dozens of kernels out there. Does another TCP IP stack add value? Not really. There's plenty of those. What really adds value, at least from our perspective, is uh, more, more applications and better written applications that you can use as a starting point for your product, uh, proprietary features that gives you an edge, uh, uh, qualification, technical support, these sort of things are where, what makes, uh, makes a, a, a chip uh, make or break. So that's where we're focusing now. So very briefly, uh, the components in NCS, the blue boxes are added by us, by Nordic. The violet boxes are Zephyr. So middleware, Zephyr, and the Artos itself and the board config are all from upstream. And then applications, some connectivity protocols, and uh, some low-level wireless stacks. So we only do the low-level, it touches the, the, uh, the hardware itself, because there we have a competitive advantage. So this is just a zoom in in Tal. So for example, in the low-level part, you can see that we have the LTE, um, 
the LT layers, the multi-protocol coexistence layer. So that's something that we, don't, we only support in the SDK, so being able to run multiple protocols at the same time. Uh, uh, a proprietary 15.4 driver with extra features. And so we, we basically focus our efforts in the, in the bottom, with the, with the features, advanced features that touch the hardware and, and especially the wireless uh, radios, and at the top, applications, you know, uh, TFM integration, samples, DFU, et cetera, et cetera. So now we're going to talk a little, about, uh, a little bit about repository. So I'll start with some terminology. Uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about how do we distribute, how do we maintain and distribute from the perspective of repository management. So a repo, it's a Git repository. Uh, you probably are, hopefully are familiar with those. Uh, a fork is a modified copy of a repository that you keep regularly updated. So you have a, a repo and you have a fork and you update it. Upstream is the repository you fork. So that's how it looks like, right? And downstream is the, re, uh, the repository uh, you fork into, so that the copy you make, right? So you have upstream, which is the, the in, in, in the case of Zephyr, would be in GitHub, Zephyr project Artos slash Zephyr uh, uh, on GitHub, right? Then you fork that by making a copy, you maintain your copy, and you update it uh, regularly with the changes that have been uh, committed upstream, right? Uh, now, upstream as a verb, <laughs> to upstream something means to send a change upstream, be it a change that was already in your downstream or a change that you've written specifically for upstream, that depends. And finally, syn synchronize of merge uh, means to update a downstream with the latest uh, upstream changes. Yeah? And there's also a concept of out of tree. Uh, out of tree just means something that you do not keep in, in a fork. So instead of keeping, we, we, we'll talk about that, it's, we tend to minimize the, the amount of things we want to keep in the fork. So what we do then is we try to keep as much out of three as possible. So we want to keep the fork clean, our copy of Zephyr. So we, how we do that? We tend to send everything upstream as much as we can. We use multi-repo so that we don't have to put everything in one single repo, uh, meaning polluting the, uh, the fork. And we use as much out of three as possible. That's our approach. And it's a, an approach that we're happy with and that we, it's served us well over the years. West. A little bit about West. West is the main tool that we Nordic introduced in 2018. It's maintained by us as well. Uh, it does two main things. One is repository management, and the other one is a command line interface, a standard uh, command line interface for Zephyr, for, for building, flashing, debugging, and so on. So it has built-in and extension commands, uh, um, just as a way of uh, basically extending the functionality of Zephyr, uh, sorry, of West via the, 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 the manifest uh, repo. We'll talk about that in a minute. So how does the, the repository management work? You have a manifest repository, and inside the manifest repository, you have the manifest file. Zephyr is a manifest repository, has a, a, a manifest file in it. In the manifest file, you have a list of projects. Those projects are other Git repos which each of them at a particular revision. So in the case of upstream Zephyr, they, you have some repos that are forks from uh, other open source projects and we keep a copy of with some changes. Some others are not forks and they are sort of original to Zephyr. That's a small subset. An example is HAL Nordic, uh, our own HAL. So technically it is a fork, but uh, anyways, the point is that the, the, the idea here is that you have one central repo that points to multiple other repos at particular revisions, so that for each revision of the manifest repo, you determine all the revisions of all of the others. Okay? Then, um, importing. That's a key feature of West that we introduce in order to enable NCS. Importing means that if I have my example application, I can not only uh, point to Zephyr, which I could, but I can point to Zephyr and say, now, from Zephyr, take all of its projects and bring them over to my uh, manifest. And that's exactly uh, how NCS uh, works. So uh, NCS and NCS-based applications, so you can import Zephyr, NCS imports Zephyr, and then an application written for NCS would typically import NCS, which in turn imports Zephyr. Yeah? So that makes sense. So, uh, so indirectly, you get all of the projects that Zephyr has, you get them in your, own, um, uh, in your own workspace, in your own uh, uh, projects, so to speak. Modules, that's another key contribution that has been fundamental for us. So modules are a way of extending Zephyr 
without having to uh, modify the separate tree, the separate Git repo at all. So this is the, the main out of tree tool. Uh, basically what they do is, you have some metadata in the form of a Zephyr slash module.yaml that sits in the, in the module repo. And the Zephyr build system reads that and then pulls in kconfig device tree and source code as needed, and CMake, by the way, uh, into the Zephyr build system, which means that I can plug into Zephyr and into NCS by extension uh, additional repositories without having to touch a single line of the original repo. That's the whole point of out of tree. So uh, we use this extensively in NCS as well, because our NCS is actually a Zephyr module as well. And typically, if you write your own application and you, you have your own board, you probably want your own application repository to be a Zephyr module as well, because then automatically your board will be rec recognized by West. Uh, uh, your, if you, even if you have an SOC or a driver, it will be picked up by the build system, and so on and so on. Our repo structure, this is a very important slide. Uh, so we have our manifest repo. Uh, sorry, our manifest repo, uh, which has our list of projects. This manifest repo uh, is called SDK NRF, arbitrary choice of name. We have a library repo where we put everything that we, that we distribute as a binary blob, so to speak, as a binary. Instead of the, everything that's not source code, it's there. So some proprietary features that we don't want or cannot uh, distribute as source code. We have private repositories, a few. Some repos have to be private because of the licensing restrictions of uh, certain vendors or uh, you know, there's, there's things that we cannot have in the open for legal reasons mainly. So those are private, but they're still pointed to by the main manifest. It's just by default you won't get them unless you enable them because you have to have access to them. Then we import Zephyr. So we're saying, you can see the double, double uh, arrow here. That means that we're not only pointing to Zephyr, but actually pulling, into, pulling it into uh, our, our manifest. And with it, we, we, we pull, in, pull in the projects from Zephyr. Now, we, we, we pull them in in two forms. One is vanilla, meaning we take the exact same module that Zephyr has. We don't override it. Uh, so this is the case, for, for example, with some examples there, HAL Nordic, LVGL, LittleFS. We just pick whatever revision Zephyr has, pull it in. And then some of them we fork ourselves. So because we have changes specific to NCS on top of those uh, uh, we, uh, that we cannot have in the, uh, in the Zephyr forks, we actually make a fork of the Zephyr fork. So there's two levels of forking here. Right? Let's take MCU boot. There's an upstream MCU boot. Zephyr forks MCU boot. NCS forks the, M the Zephyr fork. Right? And then all of this comes and is picked up by the manifest as well. Uh, and finally, we have other forks. For example, connect, uh, what's now called Matter, used to be called Connected Home IP, uh, is not supported by Zephyr. So we fork it in our own GitHub organization and then point to it uh, from our manifest. Because we have, uh, and that's not the only example, we have a few. Obviously, like everything else in this uh, presentation, Everything is available in the NRF Connect GitHub uh, organization. You can look at our manifest. You can look at uh, all of our forks, except the, the, the private repositories. Everything else is uh, out there for you to inspect. Synchronization. So from time to time, maybe every couple of months, we have to synchronize. Means we bring the changes not only from Zephyr, but from MCU Boot, from Tusted Firmware M, and from other uh, uh, open source projects that we use, we bring all the changes down to our forks. That is a complicated process because, uh, first, because we have some, even though, even, even though we've gone through great lengths to have as few patches as possible in our forks, we still have some. So we still need to deal with those. And sometimes there's conflicts. So we, we use tooling to help us. We use tooling. Mainly, we use uh, a set of Python scripts. They're also open source. They're out there. Uh, you can reuse them if you want for your own projects. And we use this, this saw stack system, where our patches, our commits that are on top of uh, uh, open source projects have a special tag to help us distinguish them. So from list means this is something that we've uh, posted as a pull request to the upstream project, but it's not been merged yet. From tr because, that, because sometimes you need the change immediately in your downstream. You can't wait until they merge it in Zephyr. So you, you post it as a pull request, and then immediately you take it and cherry pick it and post it in the fork. 
uh, we have uh, from tree patches, so the, the patch has been merged, but uh, you don't, we don't, but you can't wait until the next synchronization, until the next submerge. So you just cherry pick it, take that one, and finally no up, uh, which means patches that are not applicable to the upstream, so will remain remain forever in our downstream uh, fork. And to avoid evil merges or merges with with logical changes, these NRF commits. Before the upmerge, we typically revert them, either all or the ones causing, uh, causing conflicts. And finally, once per release, we rebase. So these, these upmerges are, are done via Git merges, Git merge operations. But the problem with that is that you as a customer or a customer wants to see the easiest way for a customer to understand what we're doing is to see Zephyr and then on top our changes. That's the best way, right? Because that's the simplest way for everybody. So that's what we do. Every time we release, just before a release, we rebase all of our open source trees so that you get the pure vanilla open source project with the exact same shafts that are in the, in the respective upstreams, and then our patches on top. So what we've done in Zephyr in order to enable of this, I wanted to brag a little bit. So it's been, uh, what, uh, six years now or so with so many contributions, so, so many hours. That, so we, 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 we've transformed the tooling almost entirely since, since we joined Zephyr or since we started. We, we, we did the move from make to CMake, including the Zephyr, package, C, Zephyr CMake package. We moved from C-based kconfig to Python kconfig lib so that we could enable Windows builds. We completely rewrote the, the device tree tooling. There was something there. It was not very good, so we, we rewrote it from scratch. We reworked the SDK toolchain so that they would work on Windows and Mac OS. It was a Linux-only effect. Uh, in the beginning, we ensure, even today, that we support all of the operating systems. We introduced West in cooperation with Foundries at the time. We introduced Zephyr modules, as well as many modules upstream. We made almost everything in Zephyr out of Treeable. We introduced SysBuild. We introduced the logging and the shell subsystems, a Bluetooth controller. We overhauled the USB stack. We introduced many parts of the networking subsystem, and we maintained that. We also reworked the documentation system, which we reuse, by the way. And we made countless other distributions, uh, contributions, fixes, and, uh, and improvements. And we're not done. We want to work on a new board and SOC model. We want AMP, asymmetric multiprocessing improvements. You saw that our next chip will have more multiple ARM cores, multiple RISC V cores. We need more advanced functionality, handling multi-core, multi-image. So, and then we want also to improve the device driver model. Uh, Vestavin, just uh, my last slide. Our team, my team, or our team, uh, we're about 12 engineers. Uh, we contribute upstream. Uh, we maintain subsystems, we do the upmerges, the synchronization, we also maintain the downstream repositories, we do the release management, we rebase, we tag, we do all of that. We're all maintainers upstream, Bluetooth networking, build systems, storage, USB drivers, uh, not only in Zephyr, but also in TFM, also in, M in MCU boot. Uh, and also, we help out with any Zephyr-related issues or questions coming from customers. And that's about it. Uh, before we switch to questions, there's just... I want to remind everybody that today at 3.50, there's a maintainer's BOF, uh, Birds of a Feather, at South Hall 3C, and that we're really, really looking forward to uh, having as many people as possible to contribute to the discussion of how to get more maintainers into Zephyr and how to scale up the, 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 the maintainer count. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Uh, I don't know how the microphone thing works. Is, uh, there Oh, I'll repeat the question. Okay, go, go ahead, please. Uh, go on. Hi, Carlos. Uh, hey. Thanks for all the help on, on the, uh, the chats. Today, right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> the question is, how often do you get the um, situation when you prepare the changes that you need to get out of the norm? Mm -hmm. The cost of your set. And mm -hmm. post, post the pull request on the upstream. And then, like, you wait for it to be reviewed. And then you ship the, your change to customers in your fork. Right. I understand. So the question is, what happens if we post a pull request upstream, we cherry pick that into our NCS, we ship that, and then suddenly upstream does not accept that, and so we've shipped something that, uh, and that ha will, will need to change. The answer to that is that we're very cautious. So it doesn't tend to happen often, because what we do is we, 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 we typically wait for the next upmerge for big changes, like new APIs. We, don't, we rarely cherry pick new APIs 
big new APIs. So we wait until the, for, for these kind of changes where the new API is, is involved, we typically wait until the, 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 the change has been involved. So we get, get involved earlier. So we try to get there earlier. Sometimes it's happened and then we basically have to document, revert the change and reapply the new modified version from upstream. But it's rare. We don't have that problem very often. So, uh, you know, we're just careful is the, is the real answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, so Zephyr works for uh, multiple different ends view from different vendors. Correct. So um, when you have like hardware peripherals, like you are testing hardware yes. these are all different between the different ends view. Yes, correct. When you work on an NF5 SDK, you mm -hmm. have full control over the APIs that you use for your hardware. So what I noticed is that when you switch to Zephyr, you lost some of that flexibility. Correct. That means your hardware is more capable than the APIs That's correct. that Zephyr has. Can you tell something about sure. defending this situation? Yeah. So the question is, uh, back when we had a bare metal SDK, our, our APIs were modeled by the hardware. So if the hardware had a feature, we had an API for it. Now, because Zephyr is a common denominator sort of for all hardware vendors and not all UARTs have the same features, not all SPI buses have the same features, we have to compromise. So how do we do that? How do we deal with that? We deal with that in two different ways. Uh, way number one is some of our drivers in Zephyr have um, extensions, proprietary extensions. So for example, the clock control driver. Um, so those are specific to Nordic, but are still in upstream as part of the Zephyr code base. And so for some cases, we do that. For some other cases, we, uh, for all other cases, really, our bare metal layer, NRFX, is actually part of the SDK. So you can access it directly because they cooperate. The, so in some, if, you, if you really desperately need a feature and the Zephyr API does not cover it and it's fundamental, critical to you, you can still use, in most cases, uh, the NRFX layer directly. Not always, because, for example, if there's a sensor, then after that, and you want to reuse the sensor code, you have to use the Zephyr driver, of course. But in many cases, it can be done. And then internally, our drivers also use the special features, in many cases, special hardware features, in order to make better drivers. So that's how we deal with it. It's not perfect, but that's uh, what we found works. Any more questions? We have, uh, I think we have, well, okay, maybe time for one last question. Uh, yeah, uh, please. Yes. I mean, there are thousands of commits up there. Yes. How much effort you have to perform to add there to perform the same? Because there might be a lot of changes on the upstream version and downstream version. Yeah, the problem is not so much. No, sorry, the question is, uh, uh, how, how much time does it take us to do the upmerge to, to, up, uh, to, to, to the synchronization? The answer is, the actual Git operations are quite fast. We have tooling that just you know, automatically detects which, uh, uh, which uh, commits have to be reverted and the whole thing. The, the problem is the testing, because every new Update brings API changes sometimes, k-config changes, and that's really what takes a long time. The regressions introduced by the changes uh, that come from upstream. Yeah. I think we don't have time for any more questions, right, uh, David? We're out of time. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. But please, uh, find, I'm, I'm on Discord uh, and uh, also on the mailing list and everywhere. So just ping me there if you have questions about the, the slides or about anything at all. I'd be happy to share with you uh, uh, any additional information about our development model. Thank you very much. Thank you.